off we go. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, how we manage thousands of clusters with minimal efforts using Gardner. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I want to introduce our speakers today, Smarth, a software engineer and Hardik, a software developer, both at SAP. A few housekeeping items before we get started during the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee. There is a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end or throughout, just depending on our flow. In addition, please join our CNCF public Slack channel, hashtag CNCF online programs to continue the conversation later and address any questions you had we didn't get to. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add any questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under, under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will also be available on our online programs YouTube playlist on the CNCF channel. With that, I will hand it over to our speakers to kick off today's presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Libby. So um, thanks a lot, everyone, first of all, joining. And um, let me first of all introduce myself. So um, I'm Hardik. I'm a software de developer on Gardner on Metal. Um, previously, I was working on Gardner, mainly the machine management and auto scaling of Gardner. And otherwise, I am also once in a while active in the cluster API community and the auto scaling community in general. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is Samar Deyagonda. I'm a developer at Gardener, and I primarily work on a component called Machine Controller Manager. OK, so let's get started. First of all, the first thing first, what's the motivation? So um, uh, the webinar is actually, of course, about Gardener uh, and uh, a brief about it. So it's basically an open source initiative by SAP. It's basically a fully managed Control plane as a service that offers homogeneous clusters potentially on any cloud provider and is fully customizable and scalable. And we have been thousands of clusters for real since recently. And this webinar is about giving a glimpse around what and why and how. And we will basically be doing something interesting. Yes. So managing thousands of Kubernetes clusters at scale is not a cakewalk. And over these three to four years, Gardener has evolved to be so robust and scalable that we have actually made managing thousands of clusters a cakewalk. So Gardener primarily runs everywhere. It runs on our own infrastructure. It also runs on other cloud providers. And the experience that it gives with respect to the versions or the features offered is pretty homogeneous, even though the support is for various cloud and even our own infrastructure. It is also fully automated and fully managed, practically with zero manual ops. And it is highly scalable, even beyond a single cluster. And it is highly customizable. That is, we have given all the configuration knobs for your conveniences. Yes, and um, to communicate the idea a bit more effectively, this is what we are going to do. So we are going to host um, a hypothetical, highly consumable, once in a millennium sort of an application. Going, we are going to call it the botanist quest on a platform, which would really need something as robust as Gardner. So we will be assuming kind of a roles and we will do the role play where Hardik will be the founder of this application he spoke about, the botanist quest, which is hypothetical. And I will be the product manager for this botanist quest. And this webinar is basically going to be, you know, a set of arguments and brainstorming between us to design this gardener from scratch and convince you that such a robust platform is practically possible to exist for applications like Botanist Quest and or for also other critical applications of yours that needs such a platform uh, with the foresight features. Let's get started then. Thank you. So, hey, Samarth, um, 
Shall we then start planning on taking Potan Squares to the new heights already? Hello, Hardik. Yes, that's why I'm here. What do you have so far? So this is what I have. I have I have got one very nice Kubernetes cluster with three dedicated control plane machines, and it's basically serving a bunch of beta users. And we have got a really good feedback already for the application. And we are going to launch the general release very soon, and then our initial set of or the target new users would be around 500 or so. Pretty good. And how does the platform look like today? So um, as I said, uh, we have a beta app and that's hosted on one cluster. And the plan is that we simply scale this cluster to five. So we would have basically five clusters with dedicated control plane machines. And all of them would basically be hosting the Potani Squeezed in, in, in a hybrid model. They would also be running on different cloud providers. And yeah, that's the situation at the, at the moment. Hmm, that is good. But five dedicated clusters might not be enough scaling because as per my research, Botanist Quest is having a lot of traction in the market. And I see something similar to Pokemon Go might potentially happen with Botanist Quest too. That is, you might have planned for an expected influx of a 5x in the worst case, but your traffic might hit to 50x, which happened with the Pokemon Go, right? So you might have to have the scaling done massively and across geographical locations. Um, you said about multi-cloud. So are you planning to take the managed uh, clusters across different cloud providers? Because if you're doing so, probably uh, there won't be a homogeneous experience when it comes to managing the clusters. And also the transparency of the control plane, I doubt if we would get that. And also I want you to employ our own infrastructure that we have at different locations. So can you align the strategy, something in these regard? Mm, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. So basically I, my team is then going to replicate the installation, we would have 30 Kubernetes clusters. We'll use this awesome FUBAR tool that we have been using. It will be multi-cloud, yes, and all of them will also have three dedicated control plane machines again, so it will be super reliable, and I think it should work like a charm. I said, um, what I would also do is basically put each of or divide the clusters across different regions so that the customers in different regions are better served. And that should, I think, be good enough. Yeah. That does look good, but 30 clusters with three dedicated control plane nodes for each cluster doesn't really is as cool as it appears to be. You know why? The first reason is that the control plane nodes are never fully utilized. They are always underutilized. So let's say for 30 clusters, you will end up having 90 control plane nodes and these will only incur your cost faster than your team scaling up your clusters. And not just that, have you even considered about the operational complexities that your team might face? What if some cluster goes into volume mount issues, some cluster has an API unreachable issue, and some other cluster has some other issue, and if these things start happening simultaneously, then the team will go haywire. And more than that, how have you planned to manage the tracking of these clusters for their config files and cloud credentials, et cetera? Manually managing 30 plus clusters that too with a dedicated control plane nodes is probably not how a cloud provider or a software as a service should operate. So to summarize what I just said, with the proposed solution of having 30 clusters with dedicated control nodes for each cluster, the excessive underutilized control machines will only incur cost. There will be operational complexities as well as cluster management complexities. Hmm. Um, yeah, those are actually good points. And uh, let's take a fresh look, I would say, at the Kubernetes. Or let's, let's, let's ponder upon what we already know. So first of all, we know that the dedicated control plane machines are usually underutilized in most of the setups, as you say. Um, second point that is very well known, and also the beauty of the Kubernetes, is that the, both the control plane and the workload are somehow decoupled, so they can they don't really necessarily has to run always together. And the third and the more important point is basically the control plane components themselves are actually a full fledged workload applications. They are they can be probably be treated 
as the workload themselves. Mm. Okay. okay, so what can we actually infer from this information and maybe innovate to address your concerns? Uh, maybe we can experiment treating the control plane of the Kubernetes as yet another workload or or maybe we actually host the workload, we, maybe we actually host this workload on some other Kubernetes clusters. So we basically do Kubernetes inside the Kubernetes. What do you think about that? Wow. So, so you basically want to migrate the control plane of these clusters as workload onto another cluster. Though this essentially is Kubernetes inside Kubernetes. Isn't this like Kubeception? Um, yes. It is the chipception, and and so in order to improve the resource utilization of the control plane nodes, I think we will spawn one Kubernetes cluster manually, and then we'll call it a management cluster, and then we do we basically use that management cluster to host the control plane of other clusters. So uh, for the visualization, this is what you what you see on the screen is uh, is what I would like to propose. So we have clusters across different locations, and we simply move the control planes as a containerized applications into a single nice management cluster and uh, yeah that's what is sounds like a good idea to me as of now okay, and this uh, looks good maybe i want to take a closer look into the management cluster can you take me around it yeah sure so let, let's take a let, let's double down and let's take a, a bit closer look so essentially the control plane of each let's call them child cluster would basically have their own dedicated namespaces. So that's the first level of isolation. Of course, we don't want them to mess up with each other, so we can also isolate them using the network policies. So uh, that would be the baseline idea. And then um, another thing which I would really want to consider is that we really use Kubernetes here and uh, not invent the reinvent the wheel. So I would use deployments and stateful sets and such battle tested in build controllers to deploy the API server, etcd, cube scheduler, and, and components like that. And this, this essentially should actually reduce the blast radius by effectively having to manage only one management cluster against 30 clusters as it was in the previous case. Oh, that's, that appears to be pretty efficient. Uh, but, uh, but I think it only addresses the cost issue, right? Where the excessive underutilized control plane machines were rather uh, migrated as workload onto one single management cluster as workload. But when it comes to life cycle of these control planes and the life cycle of the underlying machines, I think we are back to square one. In my opinion, uh, you must take care of the life cycle of these hosted control planes and the workload machines of the child cluster more efficiently because uh, the, the traditional Kubernetes is not having the domain knowledge which it might want to have to manage these betters, right? Um, well, agreed on that. Um, I think we are we are circling back to the main issue. So let's again step back and, and, and look at it again. So first of all, um, it rather actually looks like a natural candidate for the controller or operator pattern. So just to just to reiterate or remind, so what an, an operator is basically a, a Go controller or Kubernetes controller, which also comes with additional domain knowledge to manage its own resources. And what we have here is basically abstracted control plane as a pod, as pods. And what we could do is basically represent this control plane with the dedicated CRTs. So in, in in a sense, um, let's let, let's do it this way. So we have a control plane pods, and then we we basically represent them using the cluster CRD. This cluster CRD would have all the knobs and necessary configuration options that decides the whole life cycle of a Q1 cluster. And in a similar way, this will help me trigger the cluster creations, rollouts, updates, patching, hibernation, deletion, and, and whatnot. And then. Uh, but this should not be it, in my opinion. So uh, on top of the cluster CRT, we would also need to take care of another very important and very dynamic uh, infrastructure component, which is basically workload machines. Uh, so we can also introduce a CRT for machines, and then um, it could look like um, uh, machine deployment, machine set, and machines. In a similar way, there are deployment, replica set, and parts. So the way a deployment controller 
somehow always ensures that a certain number of replicas of the pod are always running. And it does a very fine grained rolling updates of the pod. We could also implement the similar, uh, similar functionalities for the machine. So we have machine deployment, which would basically help us do the right kind of rolling updates and so on. And, and yes, with this kind of abstraction, if we call it the machine API, uh, we get seamless auto scaling as well, because with such abstracted dedicated CRTs, then the higher level um, functionalities or the higher level automations becomes really easy. So just imagine Cluster Autoscaler making use of this and we get free auto scaling for all cloud providers, even parameters and so on. So this helps me a lot. That is, that is, that is really good. So, so essentially you are telling that uh, the machines and the clusters that we are trying to deal with will now be treated as the first class citizens of Kubernetes along with uh, cluster controller manager in place. Yeah, sort of. And, and here is also a detailed visualization. So, so essentially, uh, uh, we would also have the cluster controller manager, of course. We would have a controller which would take care of both kinds of CRTs. And uh, this controller would be running in the management controller, management cluster. And upon creation of the cluster CRT, the control plane of the child cluster should be deployed first by the controller. And then in turn, the same controller also deploys the machine CRTs. So it basically pulls the information from the cluster's worker section. And then the rest of the things are would basically be taken care of by the machine deployment. Nice, enlightening. So this design proposal looks good to me. So shall we prototype it? And maybe you can showcase a demo for me. Yeah, sure. Cool. Then let's move to the demo. OK. You might be surprised, but I already, I already prepared it. I think I'm Whoa. just too fast. So um, uh, let's look at the demo. Uh, we have three terminals here, two management clusters, and one to uh, workload cluster. I want to quickly see the shoot. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to call it a shoot because it's my cluster. Uh, it's my botanist waste. So um, for the Q1 shoot cluster, which is called BQ demo CNCF, uh, I have I should have a dedicated namespace. The namespace which designates this particular shoot cluster, and I would expect that this namespace hosts all of the control plane components that are necessary. Got it. Let's take a look into it, and we already see that here I have. Um, on top of the essential control plane components like API server, scheduler, controller manager, I also have a few other controllers. I have introduced something uh, also for the machine API, a separate controller, which we call machine controller manager, and then also autoscaler as a separate controller on top. So autoscaler already talks to our machine API now. Okay. And uh, let's also take a very quick look inside our cluster or shoot. And it's, let's, let's take a look at its spec. So here, um, it's a glimpse uh, where we see that in the spec section, we can already see there are multiple sections. Hibernation is one of my favorite. It saves so much cost for us. We can also kind of configure all kind of Kubernetes related stuff fully transparently via the spec. And here we go and we see the worker section. The worker section is basically what we just discussed, so based on the information that I gave here, I tell minimum is three, maximum is five. I give a very fine grained um, uh, information like max unavailable and max search, which should be respected during rolling update. And then this controller basically fetches this information and prepares the right kind of machine deployments. Let's take a look at what we have in terms of machine deployment, machine set, and machines. Sure. So um, we see that we have a machine deployment with three replicas and then representing one machine set with three replicas and then three actual machine objects. OK, nice. Um, let's also take a quick look inside the machine deployment spec and see what the API actually contains. Here we see, again, for the consistency through replicas, we, this allows us to do the rolling update. This also allows us to do the recreate strategy. In case of rolling update, it would really delete the machines one by one, the way the deployment controller does. And we have a reference to the machine class and the node template to sync to sync the labels and other metadata back to the node object, back and forth node object and the machine objects. Because essentially, the machines are really dynamic. Right. And um, yeah, what we could do more, I think we could quickly change 
because I claimed it should take care of the life cycle, let me actually make make a very small change in the shoot. So before that, I would I would watch the machine deployments and I would also watch the nodes of my workload cluster. So three nodes designate the three machine objects that are there in my management cluster. And let's edit our shoot object or the cluster object. And here um, I would make a small change. What I would do is that uh, I would change the machine types from let's say X large to two X large. And with with a minimal change, and this is actually the power of the declarative approach with uh, once I make this change, my controller, which is running in the back end, is going to reconcile this particular change form or it's going to update uh, during the reconciliation, it's going to update the machine uh, deployments, machine sets, and so on. That there is a change in the worker section where the machines previously running for X large, now they should be running on 2X large. But the uh, the catch or the magic is that it should not be done abruptly because um, uh, we actually don't want to handle only infrastructure here. We also want to take care of the pods running on them. So because I said max unavailable was zero and max search was one, it created a new machine and it will actually wait for the new machine to join. Until then, it would not delete the machine from the previous uh, previous set of machines. So a one machine is in the pending state and um, it would wait till this new machine joins and only after this new machine joins, it would go ahead and delete one of the old machines. Okay, this, this looks good. So essentially every machine is backing the node object that is actually uh, attached or registered to the cluster, correct? Yes, that's true. And the internal node object is basically the virtual machine or the real machine. And also of one thing is that this, uh, this what we are, what we see here is infrastructure related stuff. But if you would have a pod running on one of the machine, and if that pod says, um, I have XYZ pod SLS that this particular machine I am running on should not be deleted unless there is another replica or there are, there are enough replicas, then this controller is smart enough, or, or I would say this controller uses the brain feature in such a way that such pod SLS and uh, disruption budgets are also very properly taken care of. And the GIF, with a bit of a fast forwarding in between, we already have all the three brand new nodes available placed one by one. So that's what I have as a very at a very initial stage to show you. This, How do you like it? This, this already looks good to me. So it is honoring the infrastructure SLAs as well as it is also honoring the SLAs for the applications that are running as pods within that infrastructure. And this looks pretty good to me to see uh, the infra is being handled as uh, custom resource objects in a pretty declarative way. This this is really nice. Okay, uh, this is all good, but I see that all the control planes of these shoot that you call because you are botanist quest, all these shoot clusters control plane are sort of hosted on a single management cluster as workload, but the shoots are distributed across regions. So I see a potential issue of cross region latency here. Alongside this, uh, if I'm having one management cl cluster, let's say, and this guy is hosting several control planes of several shoot, it should hit an upper limit, correct? That after a certain number of clusters, whole control planes hosted there, maybe it cannot accommodate more. So you might want to scale the management cluster, right? So can you just explain me how you're handling these two aspects? Mm, yeah, those are again good points. And honestly, I see a very straightforward solution to this. So um, see, we have one management cluster. And if, if the latency is the problem, then um, if we could simply replicate this management cluster to other regions, and that should basically solve the problem. Although it looks that we are having, instead of one management cluster, we are having more management clusters, but um, uh, all of them would basically be auto-scaled. So each management cluster has the cluster or a scaler, which will make sure that they do not have excess number of replicas, uh, excess number of worker machines with them. Okay, okay. Uh, if I have to uh, rephrase what you just told, then we are going to replicate the management clusters and host the control planes of those shoot in the geographic uh, vicinity of the distributed management clusters, correct? Yes, that's true. Hmm. 
Good. So this idea is nice. So probably the cross latency, cross region latency is kind of handled here. But uh, with time, you see, with increasing workloads, with increasing number of shoot, the density of shoot will increase. And uh, we might have to scale the management clusters also in a pretty large number. So how do you plan to manage these management clusters? So is there mm. an elegant mechanism that you have already thought about? Mm, okay, yeah, that's also a valid argument and you already got me through entangled into it. Um, I would say, I feel we are, I don't want to back, I, I, don't, I don't want to fall back to the square one. So let's take a look at it again from what we have discussed so far. So what we had, um, you know, phase one, we had uh, plenty of clusters with a dedicated control plane in one location. And then we saw the problem that uh, we have a lot of resource being underutilized. So we decided that we move few clusters, few of the clusters to different locations in different regions. And this worked pretty well. But again, um, this, this situation has its own um, set of problems that, uh, again, we have plenty of control planes running at plenty of locations. So we then um, say, let's go to the phase two and introduce a management cluster. So we said, okay, having plenty of clusters is fine, but let's move the control planes from them to one single management cluster. And that solved the problem at a certain extent for us. Mm, but this again introduced the issue of the Cross latency. latency. So the, the latency is again a bit of a trouble. So we replicate the management clusters to the geographic vicinity. So we moved all of the clusters to their different regions. This worked well, but Again, we fell into the same problem that we have. We could have actually possibly plenty of management clusters. So the way we had to manage plenty of uh, shoot clusters, we now also have to manage plenty of management clusters. Um, to be honest, what um, looking at the cubeception and uh, you can looking at the recursive approach, I would go bold and introduce another cluster. Let's call it a super management cluster, and. I would migrate the control plane of these management clusters to this super management, this super management clusters workload. And to make our lives a bit more easier, I would introduce another CRD and let me, I'll call it a management cluster CRD. So essentially now I have a management cluster CRD, which takes care of my management clusters. And then I also have to shoot CRDs and machine CRDs. So the machine CRDs can also be used for the management clusters in general with, with, because it's completely recursive. And, um, our cluster controller manager runs at the top level at the super management cluster. Okay, okay. Uh, I think this proposal is also pretty good. So uh, if I understand this correctly, then the cluster CRD and the machine CRD that we were speaking about in the before slide, so that cluster CRD will now be a part of, or it will be applied or created in the super management cluster because the cluster controller manager is also running there. And even these super management cluster, uh, even these management clusters will be represented as management cluster CRD in our super management cluster, correct? Yes, that should, I think, solve the race issue, hopefully. Yes, yep. Uh, I think this looks like a sophisticated design that kind of convinces me that we can now manage thousands of clusters. So. To actually answer this question, can we now already manage thousands of clusters? Probably we want to look at the flow of adding one new cluster to this ecosystem and see if there are any unknown unknowns, right? Yeah, certainly. I would not be so quick to judge. Um, let's let's take a quick look and let, let, let's let's see what we have so far and what we can do. So currently, we create a cluster object in a super management cluster, okay, and that will be processed by the cluster controller manager. Then um, we are manually assigning this cluster to one of the management clusters. Okay, that sounds fuzzy. Then the third step is basically the cluster controller manager reconciles this cluster object and then it creates the control plane and in the dedicated namespace. That's good. And at the end, the cluster controller manager, of course, takes care of the rest of the life cycle of this control plane in maintaining it. Um, hmm. Looking at this flow, do you also see what I see? Um, hell yeah. So this, there seems to be a similarity between, um, what we do with the control plane. I think Kubernetes actually does something very similar at a very fundamental level with the pods. I would say. Sure then let's compare and find the design parity. 
maybe we are aligned yes i would actually think that let, let's take a step back and let's let's look at a kubernetes what kubernetes does with the pods so essentially we have a kube api server yes and then we have scheduler controller manager so scheduler's job is actually uh, although, although it's, it's really important its job in essence is to assign a node so it would just update the node name field on the pod and that's its job kube controller manager of course takes care of uh, certain other lifecycle aspects um, I also know that there is kubelet on each of the nodes. So, the, so when a pod is introduced, it's assigned to a node, and then the, cube, the respective kubelet uh, will basically fetch the definition, create the pod or container. Mm, that's actually a deja vu moment. So let's see what we have. We have a cluster aggregation server, or let's say a standard server, which, host, which is going to host our cluster CRDs or shoot CRDs. Um, we already have the cluster controller manager, which, and this controller manager is creating control planes. Um, okay, that's something that could be improved. On the other hand, I also see that we have um, we already have the control planes running on the management cluster. So, what's actually missing here? I think there are um, um, mainly two components which are really at the core of Kubernetes and could really also be helpful to us. So I can already think of a cluster scheduler. So a cluster scheduler which assigns a cluster to a particular management cluster the way a kube scheduler does, and a cluster lead, where a respective cluster lead will basically fetch the definition of the cluster object and then spawn up the control plane and then do the rest of the business or the business logic that we need to do. And um, I think the, the interesting uh, phenomenon, something or something that I would really like to uh, put out explicitly, is that with the introduction of the cluster lead, we are actually separating the whole of the business logic out of the cluster controller manager, of, which which was related to deploying the control planes, and this really really helps us scaling. So I can think of plenty of management clusters now, and plenty of cluster leads doing their job independently. That is nice. Oh, and um, now let's let me stretch a bit and name it. So for the pot on quest, let's name of whatever small design that we have prepared and let's name it a gardener. And I would introduce gardener here and I would say, what's the design of the gardener? So the gardener's design is, is exactly similar to what we saw previously in the previous slide that we have a Gardner API server, then we have a Gardner scheduler, Gardner controller manager, which does the same as what we just discussed. And then the Gardner garden lit, which is a sense of um, a high scale. And then on each of the seed cluster, we have one Gardner garden lit hosted, which is responsible for managing the control planes, which are going to run on those particular seed clusters. So if you look at the mapping, then this Gardner scheduler becomes a kube scheduler, Gardner API server becomes a Kubernetes API server, Gardner controller manager becomes the kube controller manager, the seed cluster becomes the management um, the cluster, or the seed cluster becomes the node objects in the Kubernetes. Gardner lead is, of course, the kube lead, and the control shoot control plane is the pod. Wow, this, this looks fascinating. And you know what, just, just to add, so this is the core of the cotton design. It maps to the design pattern of Kubernetes as we see. So we can really actually reuse the skills. In effect, uh, in effect, a conception model of turtles all the way down, along with the requirement of delivering a fully managed Kubernetes as a service step by step, actually led us to this architecture. Now, initially, our requirements are for running the pot and SQS application on Kubernetes motivated the whole platform. But now, since um, this platform is not only uh, 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 this platform is really for everyone for to build applications on top as well. That is good. That is good. So, what we started for ourselves looks like it has become a novel for all other potential users too. This is this is good. So, going forward, uh, I really like the the design already. Uh, but you know. We don't want to miss one important aspect because now we are making it available for majority of the customers that might find potential usage for this. So with increasing adoption, we might want to support even more cloud providers. And this may force us to switch to different operating systems and to different network plugins and to different other aspects of the cluster management. So with ever evolving cloud native ecosystem, our systems also have to be completely extensible. So 
some a system where you know the batteries are included but they are swappable so in essence i just want to bring in a thorough extensibility to this gardener that you have built Samar, that's really a great point and i can't agree more with you i would say the extensibility should be at the very very core of any good design and gardener supports a very neat and kubernetes native extension model so each extension point is essentially a provider specific controller very similar to how extensibility is designed for cloud controller manager for example in kubernetes and uh, a very simple example would be actually for the cloud providers themselves where you can see that gardener gardener would basically declare a neat Colang interface for a provider, and then the provider would have to implement that particular in interface. The interface content would be a bare minimum functions, which would be needed for a gardener to support, or which would be needed for a full fledged Kubernetes to run on a particular provider. One of the one of the simple example would be the gardener extension provider AWS, which is targeted for the AWS. And this, of course, this this approach recursively builds on Kubernetes support for various other providers as well. Um, so this was that that's theory, but let's actually look at a beautiful outcome of a, of a well-defined extension model, or I would say the well a power of well-defined extension models. So we, this this is basically a one a simple or uh, single gardener installation where there are a large number of clusters being managed on different cloud providers. Um, basically, a gardener is the support management cluster, it runs inside the support management cluster that can host the control plane of the seed clusters, which are the green dots in the support management cluster. Then the workload machines are basically the seed clusters. The workload machine of these seed clusters are basically deployed on different cloud providers in different regions as the, as the case fits based. And then um, to maintain the, uh, to have the least resource latency, the workload machines of the actual end user clusters, or let's call them the shoot clusters, those are deployed in the same region and they have the control being hosted on the management clusters for cloud. And this is what I have. And this looks uh, as if it can actually handle a large number of clusters if this actually works also, and not only on the paper. <laughs> yes. And, and this picture of this ecosystem of Gardner looks so beautiful. I'm actually not able to take my eyes off, but I'm forcing myself to do so because I want to see this in action. So let's go to a demo. Okay, so let me um, show you the demo of what I just talked about. What we see on the screen is a Gardner dashboard to have a better user experience. Of course, everything can also be done from the terminal. Um, on what we see is basically cluster secret members, uh, some uh, utilities, and then we already saw a demo, the PQ demo CNCF cluster, where there are a few fields, different sections that can be configured in a given a given cluster, and you have, a, you have a chance to directly fall into the terminal from there. So what you just saw in the overview, of course, everything there, the essence of them is basically also in the YAML file here. So you basically change this YAML file, so you, you can declare everything in the YAML files as well. And let's actually try to create a new cluster and see how the flow looks like. So I'm going to create a cluster on AWS. I'm going to call it Botanist. Here, um, the version is 1.20. I can set different purposes. Let's call it evaluation purpose. Um, I'm going to use the standard AWS secret for that, just access key and so on for the worker pools. Um, I would basically use m5.large. I can choose other worker sizes. Let's use m5.large. I could use Cardinal Linux operating system, Docker. Um, I would keep min and max as one and two. Um, maintenance, so I would, I would keep it as it is. So only in this maintenance window, the cluster would be rolled out and not in any random time. And then of course, my personal favorite is hibernation where, where I would say every day at 5 p.m. my cluster should be hibernated because this is just evaluation cluster. So I would actually save a lot of cost by bringing down all the machine and control planes every day at 5 p.m. Um, of course, same can be done with the YAMLs and let's not wait long and go ahead, create a cluster. What I also see is a tracker. Basically, it says create processing. So the tracker keeps me up to date in terms of what's what's going to what's happening right now with some of the detailed messages. And um, it says it's, it's deploying the external domain. And let's now look at the backend. So at the Gardner API server, I would expect to see another shoot cluster, which we just created via the dashboard. I already see a botanist as a new shoot cluster. 
And now, um, it says the creation is processing. I would also like to see a seed clusters, specifically the AWS seed cluster, because we created the cluster on the AWS. So I have one seed object, which says it's ready, and it is in the EU East 1. Now, I am going to watch my shoot clusters to see how the progress is going on. The next terminal, let's relate our let's relate our terminals to our actual diagrams. So we have, we have a Gardner scheduler which maps to the Gardner scheduler here, and I would expect it should have already done something with with the shoot object that I just registered. Let's see. Yeah, I see a message which clearly states that. Um, it has been scheduled to the seed, which is AWS. It has different, it can also be plugged with different kinds of scheduling strategies if you want, the way we do with the Kip scheduler. And um, perfect. Let's, if it's assigned to the AWS, then this is the carbon lead which is running on the AWS seed cluster or the AWS management cluster. And here, I would expect this carbon lead should have at least started doing something. At least it should have fetched the definition and start to create the uh, control plane ports. And I already see that there are there are demo pro botany slash botany, which basically refers to our cluster. And it has already started processing that cluster. I think it's doing something in the background. We'll get to know that in the next next terminal. Then I can also take a quick look at the Gardner controller manager now. So we have from the diagram, I know that the controller manager is responsible to take care of other lifecycle aspects of my shoot cluster. And I see that the hibernation and maintenance are basically the subcontroller of it, and they are also already taking care of those aspects of my cluster. And now the most important or the most interesting uh, aspect of the whole system that we just just we get it right. So the control plane is what we are going to look at now, that which is running in one of the seed or the management cluster, which is AWS in our case. And let me zoom in. Let's search for the namespace, which is dedicated for our cluster. I already see one namespace. Let's get inside it and see what's what's already deployed or what's happening. OK, so I see there is already API server in etcd. I think more ports are coming. We also have a nice logging and uh, monitoring setup with, with Loki. And, um, on the other hand, uh, I would also be later on be interested in looking at the workload cluster. But essentially, um, if, we, if we try to recall what we just learned in the diagram, so from the API server, it has reached to the Gardner scheduler, from scheduler to Gardner lit, from Gardner lit to in parallel to Gardner controller manager, and now on the management cluster, we see something happening. And the dashboard says shows clearly that the creation is ongoing. Um, I think it should take in the infrastructure a few five to seven minutes or so. Um, I would suggest let, let's take a look at another key, other key features some earth meanwhile while the cluster is being created. Sure, sounds sounds good. So um, to add to the whole thing, um, what we saw was the day one in general. So creating a cluster, even creating thousands of cluster is still, is still okay. But what really happens and what's really more fascinating is what uh, what's going to happen on day two or day three and so on. So we are, go we are going to have, or we already have the customers or the people who would generally create uh, lots of lots of workloads on their cluster. And in such cases, we don't want our API server to die. We don't want our other control plane components to be exhausted. So what, what's there? to save us is basically the horizontal vertical pod autoscaler. So what it does is really fascinating. It autoscales the pods, control plane pods, both vertically and horizontally as the situation demands. And then we have etcd backup and restore. So this is, the, this is our savior for the disaster and recovery where um, uh, the, this sidecar container basically keeps on taking the snapshots of the etcd, let's say every one hour, this is perfectly configurable. So it takes full snapshot every one hour, and then it takes the delta snapshots every few seconds. And then um, at any point in time, if things go south, it would basically restore the entire cluster using the 
snapshot taken previously, and it would give us kind of a point in time recovery of loss of only a few seconds of the data. The next next one is also my favorite, where uh, Gardner goes one step beyond, and it actually does the automatic seed provisioning. Now we. If you look at the design, we saw that we assumed that there are always X number of uh, management clusters available. But what if uh, we have a sudden increase in the cluster number of clusters and someone just creates 1,000 more clusters and then we don't have enough capacity in the existing management clusters? So Gardner also offers such features where um, the new cluster is automatically, new management cluster is automatically added and it actually load balances the whole control plane across different management clusters. And that is very thoughtful. Yes, that, that comes with the experience, <laughs> with the hard way of learning things. And then um, the last one is, of course, the auto scaling of all, all of the clusters at all of the layers that we just talked about. And this auto scaling is the key, uh, key feature of enormous amount of resource um, savings, I would say, because this cluster auto scaler basically always scales our super management cluster, management cluster, and the actual shoot clusters. And it works in a cloud agnostic fashion, as, as we discussed that because it supports the machine API, which is Gardner's machine API, if it's, it basically only has a common denominator requirement that if a, if a cloud provider has a create machine and delete machine APIs implemented, which is like a bare minimum, then the autoscaler would be able to do, the, do its job of autoscaling all the machines as per the requirement. That that is pretty cool. Uh, probably we want to relook at the cluster creation state here. Looks like it is done. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's already created, and it takes to only a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Wow, that was really good. And so we, I already see that we have a set of adopters who are running Gardener and managing thousands of clusters at ease. So. Obviously, at SAP, we use Gardener internally for development purposes and also for production workloads. And uh, it is utilized by software developers and all the line of businesses across the globe. Gardener creates, hibernates, scales, deletes hundreds of clusters on a daily basis. Gardener is operated by a central platform team and its premier usage within SAP leads to synergies on total cost of development and reduced cost of operations in multi-cloud environment. Gardener is also in use by other cloud providers such as FITS who have extended Gardener into their metal stack and Stack IT, T Systems, 23 Technologies applies Gardener's multi-provider feature for its Gaia X, a federated European sovereign cloud initiative, Pink App, the makers of TIKV and TIDB run their commercial database as a service, offering on top of Gardener landscapes, and many of the same reasons apply. Running critical applications and critical systems off record requires you to have complete access on your control plane. And each component of Gardener is completely independently consumable, right? Which is why it has also witnessed a uh, some of the nice innovations wherein they have powered Raspberry Pi with Kubernetes using Gardener's machine API implementation. And Gardener also often sees some of the external contributions from adopters to support next generation use cases, uh, such as spot instances uh, of Kubernetes nodes. And interestingly, the innovation does not stop in the infrastructure domain. Peculiarly, Gardener managed seed clusters around globe can be thought of standard Kubernetes infrastructure that can host a platform service outside the end cluster, but near to control plane, right? And Gardner also ships with multi-tenant, multi-cluster capabilities uh, of DNS and the certificate service. As a user, you just need to annotate or apply a custom resource in your cluster to consume these value added, but managed services. So think about it. Gardener has the minimum architecture that is needed to provide all types of related services. Think Istio, Linkerd, or think Crossplane in a managed way. So for us and our community, Gardener is more than just a Kubernetes cluster as a service. Hey, and, and yeah, of course, towards the end, 
um, uh, bullseye question or a million dollar question. What's the relation with the cluster API? We know what's cluster API. It's, 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 a, it's a great community project, which has a very similar purpose and we are often asked about it. So um, in general, with the latest cluster API specification, um, it is possible to delegate the specific subcluster management to a separate control plane provider. So it's, it's the extension model of the cluster API. So there is already a battery included with this Cube ADM control plane provider, and that works pretty cool with the dedicated control plane machines. But then with the, with the whole concept of control plane controllers being an extension, what is the possibility or what we are planning to do is basically to have another control plane provider, provider which is going to be the Gardner control, control plane provider. Of course, it is not yet implemented. It would, be, it would be implemented and we would be really, really interested if there is any traction for externally from anyone who would, be, who would be helping, who would be willing to help us or would be willing to consume or have a feedback on this. Wow. So great things in place and great things on the way. Nice. So, and I just wanted to show a funny, funny meme, which one of our fellow developers have created because he could not really resist when the whole team was creating thousands of clusters and Gardner managed it nicely. <laughs> Thanks to team for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yep, that so is it. Yeah, guys, so Gardner already has actually a significant community in the social media. Please do join us. We would love to hear your feedback, suggestions, contributions, complaints, or otherwise, just to say hello. <laughs> Are there any other questions from anyone? Sounds like I you see, did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I see one question from um, Dhru Tucker. I can probably answer that question. So his question is that doesn't replication of management clusters across regions again increase the cost factor? Yes, certainly. And um, I think in the flow we answered that already. So increasing having more management clusters has basically two effects. One is the complexity of manage, managing more clusters, one, and the other one is the cost. So the first one is of course targeted by the super management cluster, and the second one is targeted by having a very well defined auto scaling of the management clusters themselves. So if you have a one management cluster with large number of machines, that would not be very different. If I have a few management clusters, but their machines are basically divided across different regions. All right. Last chance. Anyone have anything else? There you go. Thank you. Oh, I think there was um, one more question. There is one more question from Mandar. Does Gardner facilitate GitOps and deployment of workloads to the cluster? Um, this is a very, very interesting question. So this, this question falls um, slightly outside of the bucket of the Gardner, but we do have the um, uh, we do have the ecosystem where we want to basically not only take care of the cluster management, but also take care of the life cycle of the applications which are going to run on top of the cluster. And that you can probably find under the Gardner org, or I could share it later with the flying. It just follow the name of that. But we, we, do, we do have the whole facility, which is, which is basically going to take care of the whole ecosystem of the applications themselves as well. Okay. Thank y'all very much. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, this again, the recording and slides will be up later today on the website. And thank you again for attending another CNCF live webinar. Thank you to our presenters and everyone have a great day and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Have a nice